the first thing I've been asked to do is to uh, say briefly what psychosocial research is and to have something that's so compelling that it will pin you to your seats. That's what the, a quote. It says, please pin your audience to their seats with what you have to say. So I hope it does the trick. Okay. Psychosocial and psychoanalytic research, I've sort of been asked to talk about these together. And it, in fact, it's psychoanalytic theory in the service of psychosocial research that I will be talking about today. Psychoanalytic research is, uh, is a vast um, tradition in, in psychoanalysis. It's very, very much uh, specific to psychoanalysis um, and psychoanalytic practice, but in a sense taking the idea behind psychoanalysis, psychodynamic theory, which wants to understand the concurrent dynamics of the internal mind, what's going on in the mind as the individual interacts with the social world, um, both as an individual and in groups. What's going on inside the mind and the body as the social self moves through the world? Um, how, how does this work? And so I've broken the psychosocial down into the psycho, um, the internal world, that each of us populates, and these are the elements that really relate to um, psychodynamic thinking, our, our thoughts, our feelings, our fears and fantasies, um, motivation and volition that drive us, drive our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, um, what we say and what we don't say and what we can't say. Um, and so this is both at the conscious and unconscious level. And then if we add the social, we then place, place the psychodynamic, the individual internal state, into the social context, the external context within which we live in dyads and groups, um, in multiple and concurrent collectivities, uh, your family, your workplace, your, your village or your neighborhood. Um, these are all concurrent um, collectivities. Um, and the interactions within and between the collectivities within which individuals think, feel, and behave. So if I were to draw a map of someone's life, it would sort of start with a big circle in the middle um, with a lot of arrows going in of what's going on um, on the inside of their, of their mind. Um, and some of that would be conscious and some of it would be unconscious. And then there would be many arrows and many other circles with which that individual was located. So are you pinned to your seats? Yes, good, oh, so glad. The psychosocial and the psychoanalytic um, approach to research assumes that thoughts, feelings, and behaviors co-occur in the individual's unconscious and conscious minds. So right here we're buying into um, the psychodynamic framework. It generally draws on psychodynamic and psychoanalytic theories of the mind. We'll talk a little bit about some of those theories, but it's a vast literature. It's founded on the concept of ego, the organization within the mind of ego as the functioning, autonomous, adaptive organization of the mind. It doesn't always work so well, but that's the, the purpose of ego. It's sort of the core of, of the, of how you are organized, um, how you how you proceed in the world, and translate external stimuli into um, your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It actively studies forces in social and cultural contexts as they impact upon what would be the normal development of the ego. So this kind of research is really looking at social and cultural contexts simultaneously with looking at what's going on in the internal landscape. It seeks to understand social, cultural, political, and other influences that affect individuals' thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So we're not just looking at the internal landscape at the individual level, but we're looking at what's going on around the individual in, in context. And perceives responses to these influences, or stimuli if you like, um, as mechanisms of defense to sustain and protect the ego. So as we are stimulated by our environments, by people, by events, 
by any kind of stimuli that we take in, um, we respond to them in ways that our, by our minds are trying to, and our bodies are trying to protect the ego, trying to protect that adaptive, autonomous functioning. So we really need to be looking at what these are as well. So I was asked to tell you about history. There isn't enough time from now until the end of time to tell you all of it, but um, it's about 100 years of history going back to Sigmund Freud um, and his colleagues. But I'm particularly today, as I am, um, I will be using my own work um, to uh, show by example rather than try to talk at you about methods in the abstract. Um, these are the three bodies of thought um, and, and theory that that I will be focusing on today, the psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic theory, um, some feminist theory, and sociological theory. Um, so th this, could, this could be uh, so much, so much more um, complex if I tried to give you a comprehensive list. But I, I hope that um, some of the references that I'll, I'm about to show you will give you an idea of some of the sort of the breadth of, of what you can do with this. In the literature of clinical psychodynamic psychology, which is what I draw on for psychoanalytic theory for um, this particular paper that I'll be um, referring to uh, for most of this talk, there's a long tradition of single subject case studies that Freud and his colleagues um, earliest ones, uh, 1910, Breuer and Freud's uh, study of Anna O, oh, which has been commented on, um, these references, you, you'll have access to these slides online, that's my understanding, is that right? So, and Dora, which is a, uh, quite a famous, um, and it wasn't published in 63, that just happened to be the edition that I had, but um, that two from the early part of the 20th century, Dora was a young woman that Freud um, famously wrote about. Um, as a single subject case study. And single subject case studies show that the method of treatment and the outcomes of the treatment of a single individual can be extrapolated um, to a larger population um, as we would want it to be for good research, yes? Exhibiting similar constellations of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And so this becomes a very valuable tool to delve deeply into the consciousness of a person as we consider them simultaneously within that person's social cultural context. Here are a few examples, uh, recent examples of psychosocial research. Simon Clark, University of West England, published this article in Qualitative Research, talking about practicing the social sciences and psychoanalytically informed theory um, to sort of lay a framework for how to do this in a practice environment, um, people who are uh, doing social services. He then wrote again several years later um, as he developed his ideas. Um, this is, this is a, uh, a pretty good progression of seeing how, how um, Professor Clark has uh, developed this idea of taking theory and practice and putting them together, which is what I do in, in this example I'll be um, get, showing you at some length in a few minutes. Professor Gad's work on the uh, former far-right activist and really, again, doing a single subject case study looking at, um, at, at hate crime, race crime um, in social context. Um, I also put the keywords here so you can see how in a very interdisciplinary way of conducting research, how, how you begin to sort of um, model the, um, the, the, the framework. Um, that you're taking um, research from, from each of these bodies of, of work, of theory, and, and bringing them together. Lisa Seville Young's work in qualitative inquiry um, just last year, just about a year ago, um, looking at um, race and class in South Africa um, in interview context when doing, um, conducting qualitative research. Um, that she uses Lacan's uh, Lacanian theory um, to, to conduct her analysis. So these are just these are just some examples that um, to kind of give you an idea of a little bit of an idea of the breadth of this method. 
And this is the uh, paper of mine that, um, that we'll be looking at in some depth now. From feminist criminology uh, about five years ago, um, this, uh, I'll spend some time um, talking about Justine, uh, uh, pseudonym, not her real name. It's not easy to know who I am, uh, is a quote from, uh, from Justine, looking at the salience of gender in her, in her life. She's 15 when I meet her. This is a little unique in that I actually was her therapist. I was um, doing a lot of clinical work at the time with adolescents. Um, I worked in a Roman Catholic um, home for unmarried teen mothers um, to which she had been court ordered. Um, and we'll get the story um, in, in a minute. Um, I, I, was, I, was her, I was her psychotherapist and so I kind of have an inside track on, on some of the material that, um, but, but I use them as interviews. I use the, the clinical material as interviews here so that if you were doing interviews, you would be able to use the same method to look at it. Now that sounds like a real, really problematic um, young woman. What was stunning about Justine and why um, I spent an awful lot of time writing about her is because she was remarkable for her ego strengths and her resilience, her adaptability to situations that are right out of the textbook on what's wrong with 15-year-old mothers, um, should have been huge challenges, and she, she just keeps working on it. She's so bright. She's so determined to keep her baby um, and to make him a healthy boy um, and to avoid the pitfalls and the, and the griefs that she has experienced. Um, so you'll get to know her a little better. These are the key words that I chose, and you can see from before how I'm drawing on um, psychoanalytic um, theory, feminist theory, um, and uh, sociologic theory. You can see how those fit into this. Um. So my research question, such as it was, and this is approaching um, this from a, at first, a therapist's point of view. So this is really translating this into a single subject case study. Um, I didn't start out with a uh, sort of a priori set of assumptions about how I was going to conduct a research project. Um, this emerged from, uh, from the clinical work I had done with her. What are the meanings of subjective gender in the context, context of objective gender, as um, Nancy Chatterall describes it? Um, in cultural place of a biracial, bisexual, and bicultural 15-year-old mother um, who is court-mandated to therapy and to this um, residence um, with presenting in, in, in therapy with really mild anxiety, uh, mild anxiety and dysphoria, uh, just a general unease with herself, just not comfortable in her skin to address issues of oppositional behavior and anger. These were the two uh, behaviors that led to her court-mandated therapy um, that she was described um, by the evaluating clinicians as having an oppositional defiant disorder and um, inter intermittent explosive anger. So to get social about this for a minute, I, I'm, I'm going to observe her as I would in an ethnography. And I start off by s giving you a picture of her. Um, Justine, this is when I first meet her. Um, head bowed, her body is lost and baggy and dark and androgynous clothing. She's pushing her baby boy toward me in a worn stroller. To, um, she's sort of sashaying down this very cold blue tiled corridor. Um, of this uh, maternity home where she's been sent. She's African American and British. She's 15 years old. She's unmarried. She's homeless. She's in trouble with the courts. Has a substantial trauma history. Has been has lived with and been rejected by her mother in the UK and her father in the US. So I, I'm just introducing you now to, to Justine. And this is the sort of thing that I 
it helps me to, to sort of be with my subject, um, is to actually um, describe as though I'm introducing her to you. Psychoanalytically oriented psychotherapy lasted only six months before she was suddenly and punitively discharged from the maternity home. The substance of our exchange evoked profound questions of gender and culture that are the subject of this paper. To further describe her, I note her small stature, very fine bone, very small, diminutive, and very quiet voice. Um, because her physical characteristics belie her, her ego strengths and subjectively her life's remarkable achievement, which is to survive at this point, this image of Justine is intended to keep both at the forefront. So if you have a picture in your mind of what this girl might look like, that's where I'd like you to keep with you. It helped me to recognize and respect that she was still a child and that I, in, as a researcher, was coming toward this as dealing with a child and really very much focused on strengths-based therapy. The page numbers here refer to the published article about Justine that uh, appears in Feminist Criminology. So if you, uh, I don't know, can you post a link to that on the web page? So I'll post a link to that and you can, you can see the PDF will correspond to the slides. Justine spent much of her early life in care and protection in, in the UK and Life course events pushed her back and forth between the UK and the US. Um, she was adjudicated by a court in the US. Um, I treated her for six months, uh, mostly working mostly with techniques of psychodynamic psychotherapy, which was um, a very appropriate approach to her trauma history. Um, there's no way that we can spend the time that we need to for you to fully understand the sort of psychoanalytic theories of trauma that, uh, but again, if you look at the website, that the web page, you'll be able to um, kind of follow that thread. But Shane Gold's work on soul murder, the um, profound effects of child abuse, and Anna Freud's work with children in wartime, which gives us, gives us a psychoanalytic conceptual model of childhood fears were my sort of framing theories for understanding these data. In this, just so you understand what I was doing, this approach to therapy, the clinician works with what's at the surface of the client's conscious unconscious. So it's what she brings up. And me being clever enough, one hopes to follow that. This produces a data pool. It's the same as doing an interview. It's like doing a good interview and following up. This method of therapy is called psychoanalytically oriented. Sometimes it's called psychodynamic therapy. And I here am focusing on gender, race, and power. So these are the three basic fears of childhood that Anna Freud produced in her conceptual model after working with children who, in uh, London who had been um, evacuated from, from their families um, or had had other kinds of separations, uh, broken attachments, disrupt, disruptive attachments uh, from death or uh, other ways of being separated. Um, the fear of the loss of the love object the fear of loss of love from the love object, and fear of annihilation. Um, all of these produce anxieties and other, um, other uh, trauma, traumagenic effects that we'll see a little bit of. Anna Freud was also very careful to talk about the two essential differences in the variable experiences of people who experience trauma. One is basic constitutional differences, how people just are, are differently composed. And differences of experience of pain, the, um, the actual experiences themselves. Phyllis Greenacre, in commenting on Anna Freud's comments on trauma, um, talks about the inevitability of revisiting trauma, especially the revisitation of the original event in the face of similar stimulus. So if something ha bad happens, we have a proclivity for, to experience that again, especially if the same stimulus presents itself and the recapitulation of the effects. Is that, that's, that's clear, yeah? Um, this, this is very important with, um, it, with Justine's uh, situation. And Shangold, the other um, theorist that I referred to a couple of slides back, in his construct of soul murder, talks about how so very important attachment is that for a traumatized child, 
an abused child, a neglected child, a child who's witnessed or experienced trauma. The terror of abandonment, that loss of love of the love object, or loss of love from the love object, exceeds the terror of the abuser. So there's a kind of knitting together of the child with the familiar attachment in spite of harm that may occur. So even as abuse or the threat of abuse continues, the child clings to the familiar object of love. I've just told you how disruptive Justine's um, early childhood was. Gender, according to Chaudhary, referred to in the actual research question, is objective. She says gender is objective in the sense of documenting empirically prescribed and proscribed behaviors and characteristics and the meanings of both for male or female identification. So she says you can actually catalog gender by looking, by observing, um, by listening, and so forth. You can actually do a model of, of gender. I have to start with uh, her because she's a major psychoanalytic thinker in, in talking about gender. But if we add Miller and Stiver, they clearly embrace women's proclivity to nurture and be in relation that biological and cultural imperatives alter this. They Chaudhary, uh doubles back on herself and shuns the sort of um, essentialist characteristics that she earlier had talked about. But what's important to be thinking about in gender, and gender is a big issue in Justine's life, is the rejection of a, they talk about the rejection of a psychological model that endorses one normative path in development called development and recognizes the differential experience as the core of the individual psychological self. This has profound effects for Justine. Remember that she describes herself as bisexual after having had and, and only has uh, girlfriends after having had a baby at um, 14. Bell Hooks, counter-hegemonic cultural practice, in writing about race and gender and cultural politics, new ways to black identity, black insight, black autonomy um, in the African-American context. Um, in writing about radical black subjectivity, she proclaims the use and practice of traditional ways of black folk in the public white-dominated social context to be self-strengthening and healing for those who are disparaged. Um, she sees the oppression of African Americans as having produced a colonized mentality. Justine is a biracial girl in a, an all-white Roman Catholic maternity home where she is disparaged for her appearance, her conduct, um, her values, her identity, um, and so uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more of that later uh, after I show, I show you a little bit of the interview material. So right now we're still setting up the, the theoretical framework because psychosocial research requires drawing on theory from, from various um, disciplines. So here we're talking about counter-hegemonic um, culture in a metaphoric construction. So it's a continua of gender. It's a continua of cultural experience, including that of being the racial other. And for Justine, that is her existence in the context in which I know her. And that we're, we're creating concurrent experiential matters that help us understand how she is the radical within this hegemonic structure. The sociological perspective that I bring to this as well is um, Stephen Luke's power, a radical view, my favorite model of power, in that it allows us to talk about uh, three dimensions at the same time and to talk about power as different from influence, that the three dimensions of power are decisions that are clearly observable and conflict is clearly observable, and that those are conflict, uh, conflict of interest is necessary um, in order for a power constellation to exist according to this model. Latent conflict and non-decision making is a second dimension, and values and beliefs is the third. He 
clearly is working from evidence of a larger socio-political um, um, structure than um, psycho-intra-psychic dynamics. He's not talking about psychoanalysis here. But the elements really hold if you look at the effects of gender and race on individuals and the power differentials inherent in a, in a pluralistic network. We have Luke saying that conflicts of interest produce constellations of power. And Justine is at the mercy, if you will, of courts, of administrators of the home in which she's living, of, um, of, of various people. She's, she, she has a, um, a struggle to maintain agency. So to sum it all up, here's the psychosocial framework um, to address the research question. Trauma can throw normal character development off track because the child can be flooded with too much fear or anxiety or pain at once and cannot successfully defend herself psychologically. Okay, that's the take home on, on the trauma. And of course, children need stimulation, so deprivation of needed stimulation can cause trauma as well. So we look at child neglect as distinct from child abuse. Sociological theory supports this claim as well in the theoretical frameworks of symbolic interactionism and social exchange, if you're familiar with those bodies of theory, which explore how the individual develops social meanings from experience, internalizes them, and then utilizes them back in her social context to make sense of her interactions with others. So simply put, these sociological theories, these two particular, and, and, and each of them has many authors as well, really say people act in ways that make sense to them given what their experiences have been. And the intrapsychic and the psychosocial can join in an understanding of the world, the individual's place of the work, the profound individual, I'm sorry, the profound influence of the external on the internal and the revisions of traumatic meaning. Um, it's important to understand that children don't know trauma when they see it. They may, ha they may be living an experience that to them seems completely normal because it's all they've ever known. And it's only later that they find out that it is trauma. The effects of the actual experience, though, are still devastating. So let me just run through Justine's history a bit here. She's born in the UK in a town where university is the hub of, so, of local life. Her mother's Caucasian and British. Her father's an African-American man uh, who was stationed nearby on military duty. He left the UK before she was born. Um, I'm not even sure. She wasn't even sure that her father knew that her mother was pregnant. Her mother's a heroin addict. Um, she couldn't work. Uh, she had a drug habit of many years duration and was complicated by very serious diabetes and heart disease. And Justine was very aware of this. Father returned to the United States and in the course of the next 10 years, married twice, had several other partners, and fathered several other children, including two with women that he did not marry. Uh, Justine at this time was not with him and had no contact with him. She lived with her mother until the age of two when Child Protective Services removed her from her mother's custody because of severe abuse and neglect reports by nursery teachers. Um, the abuse was perpetrated by the mother's boyfriend who beat Justine, burned her, and attempted to drown her by holding her by her ankles with her head in the toilet and flushing the toilet repeatedly. This is when she was two years old, or up to the age of two when she was removed. She went to foster care lived with a very stable family that she had very fond memories of, then had two other children. She was there till she was six years old. Her mother's health at that point had deteriorated to the point where she couldn't take care of Justine. Um, her father called her mother and requested permission to bring Justine to the States to live with him and his wife and their new baby. Um, he came to England to fetch her. She returned with him to the States, and over the next six years, um, she lived with her father and a succession of wives and living lovers until he married a woman who didn't want Justine anymore. Um, so when she was 12, her father sent her back to England to her mother 
who at that point was in methadone um, and was receiving disability. Justine stayed with her mother, going to school about half the time, using lots of drugs, mostly marijuana and, and hash. Her mother would often um, use drugs with um, Justine, but otherwise didn't spend much time with her. Um, when she was 13, her mother took her on a week's holiday to um, some a seaside park um, resort, and Justine had a fling, her words, uh, with a 20-something-year-old man who worked the amusement rides. Uh, what I could glean from my, my interviews with Justine, my, my time with Justine, was that this was either um, uh, a date rape uh, as, 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 as a category to put it in, or it was sex for drugs. She was, um, this was her first sexual experience. Two months later, she discovered she's pregnant. She ran away from her mother's house right away, or shortly after, stayed in town for a few weeks, and she still had the half of a return ticket to the US from when her father sent her back. He had bought a return ticket for her, and she tried to cash it in. I mean, imagine a 13-year-old girl having the, the, the wherewithal to, 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 to think about something like that, um, to, to have an abortion. And that would have been an illegal abortion because she couldn't have had any, um, she, she was unwilling to, um, to tell anybody. When she couldn't cash it in, she used the ticket to return to the States. She didn't know where to go, decided to go back to the city where she had lived with her father. And a few weeks after her arrival, she was living in the subway um, and occasionally finding a place to stay. Someone saw her, someone who knew her father saw her and recognized her and called the police. And they arrested her and put her in juvenile detention as a runaway. So begins her um, involvement with the law uh, where she's an offender, not a victim. While in detention, her pregnancy was noted, her court hearing, the determination was made that she be placed in, in this, this church-operated maternity home for the duration of her pregnancy. Uh, this was like prison to her. I had a petition, it was a secure, a secure house. Um, she wasn't allowed to leave without permission. A petition was filed against her father for abuse and neglect and pending investigation of her complaints uh, because no one wanted jurisdiction of this child uh, she became a ward of the court. So she was sort of countryless um, uh, ward of the court at this point. And following her oppositional behavior, mostly resistance to treatment, um, she was adjudicated delinquent, which in um, most states in the U.S. means that you uh, generate a, a juvenile record. And the home continued to be her court-determined placement. Now she's officially a juvenile delinquent. She remained at the home for the duration of her pregnancy and stayed there after the birth of her son. When her son was born, um, she's, she's a, um, a brown-eyed, brown-skinned, brown-haired girl. Um, she gives birth to a fair, blonde, blue-eyed child. Uh, very, there's no face validity in this, uh, in this uh, by this father. Justine only knew his name. She knew nothing about him, and she named her son for significant figures in the Quran because her father was a black Muslim. So we've arrived at some psychotherapeutic uh, data here to kind of show you how I'm working this model with the material that I get from Justine. She says, she's talking about the vagaries of the neglect system and her placement and how nobody wants jurisdiction of her and she's sort of in limbo, she doesn't know where she's going and who's going to decide and when. And she says, independent living is what I want so I can get my life back on track. They'll probably put me in foster care and I'll figure it out from there. I want to finish regular high school and go to college, go on someday to be a psychologist. I should, I should interject here that she um, maintained um, honor, honor level uh, grades in her, in her schooling all through this, whenever she was allowed to go to school. I don't like most psychologists and I've met a lot, but I'd like to be one and help people. I think I could do that. I think I'd like to do that. I think I'd be good at it. But that's a long way off. I'd have to get through ninth grade first. That's the first year of high school. 
um, going to public high school rather than the home school next semester as long as I get out of this place. I hate this place. When they first said I was coming here, they said that it was a place where unread mothers go, and they told me about it, and it sounded okay, but then I came here, and it's awful. It's like jail. It's rules. It's all rules, and you're supposed to be learning to be responsible about all this adult stuff, but then they have all these rules and treat you like a little kid, and the rules don't make sense, most of them. I hate it here, and I've got to get out soon. And I'm not going anywhere without my baby. Sort of projecting into her son uh, what she what her losses and, and grief have been. Are you supposed to be helping me with that? And I assure her that I'm there to help her just sort of get clear and together about what her next steps might be. And she says, well, here's what I think I want to work on. I want to learn to control my anger and I want to learn to have more patience. Justine actually demonstrates good ego functioning here although it's clear that it was important to engage in supportive work with her. Um, she had very er little consistency early in her life, um, except the expectation of change and harm and separation. So like Shangold's description of soul murder that we looked at just a minute ago, she couldn't afford to let her attachment to the tor let go of her attachment to the tormentors in her life because she there was not even an illusion of alternate caregivers, and the void was more terrifying. Justine, however, had had the early experience with the benevolent, and one can assume from her account, foster mother um, and foster family, which clearly provided her with some elements of understanding of right and wrong and development of controls to choose. So she recognizes her deficits here um, in the large the larger social context of this um, very punitive home and residence in which she's living, she's really exhibiting some remarkable ego functioning in being able to stand in the face of what people expect of her, that is, failure. She says, maybe I could become a therapist. It sounds like a good job. I'd be good at it. I have a lot of problems myself, but I'm still good at listening to other people and helping them figure stuff out. I want to do it with art, too. My father said that if I'm going if I'm going to be a psychologist, I should be an art psychologist and work with people with drawings and stuff. Um, she does a lot of drawing, and she shows me her drawings in our meetings. She says, it get, helps me get out my frustration. My mother did it sometimes. And I tell her it sounds like she's really concerned about her mother. And she says, yeah, well, she's been on drugs most of her life, and all the needles and junk she's done to herself really messed up her body. And now she has her lug cut off. Her mother had just had an amputation from the diabetes. And they might have to cut off the other one, too, and they won't tell me what's wrong with her. And I said, and she won't tell you what's wrong with her. I said, she was, Justine said she used to be really sick to have her leg cut off, and she's still on methadone. And then she switches the you know, the ego can't take it anymore, um, the, the, the immersion in that kind of, 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 of anger and, and grief. And she says, I'm afraid, and then she just can't, she can't follow through on that thought. There's the unconscious working. And she says, look at that guy over there hitting golf balls. Well, that guy over there hitting golf balls, she says, and I pick up and I say, afraid of what? She says, afraid? What? And she's acting like she doesn't know what I'm talking about. And I say, afraid she might die? I'm talking about her mother. Yeah, I guess, and there's nothing I can do about it. She's over there, meaning in England, and I'm here, and I can't go back, and she can't come here, and there's nothing I can do about it. And I say, I think you feel, sounds like you feel powerless about this. And she says, about almost everything now, about being here, about everything. Is it okay with you to buy the cigarette now? We had gone out to uh, sit outside. I only had one today. I can take care of my baby. If I can take care of my baby, I don't know why she couldn't take care of me. I really don't remember anything good. She was always stoned. I liked nursery, though. And you see that in the absence of caring attachments in her immediate environment, as she switches back and forth by really trying to deal with the, the very uh, sort of stark, realities of, of her current life and, and and really looking for a way to to spin that into something positive that will 
make her feel supported. Maybe you're afraid because your mother let you go and your father let you go and that I'm going to let you go too. And she says, well, yeah, wouldn't you be? But you come when you say, Will, and that's something. At least that's something. And then she goes back to the guy with the golf balls. So this is actually pretty adaptive, higher level thinking that she's doing because she's really, really going into her, her the strengths that she has and trying to grapple with this really graphic imagery of the amputation. She doesn't use the word amputation. She talks about her mother's leg being cut off, legs being cut off, and she's really trying to grapple with this. But this guy with the golf balls, she's talking about hitting balls here. Um, and he's an African-American man like her father, who she's furious with, and who lets her down repeatedly. And she's sitting here with me, who resembles in many ways the foster mother that she trusted, the, the one person that she thought took care of her. I think I have one more slide here. Yes. So the social part of psychosocial in the case of Justine. I just sort of sat down and made a list. If you were doing research, psychosocial research, um, and you had Justine's data, the different theses you could write about, the different papers you could you could um, you could write about thematically. Just take just using um, this material, and this is the list I came up with. Uh, I'll go through it briefly. The race and racism and ethnicity, um, her her ambiguity about um, about who she identifies with when neither of her parents has really given her anything. Um, child abuse and child neglect, um, pretty clear from what I've talked to, uh, what I've said today. Foster care was very important in her life. Residential care, clearly important but detrimental. The court mandated psychotherapy. They cut off her therapy um, very suddenly when the court refused to grant jurisdiction. Um, they, each of them kept refusing the jurisdiction, I should say. And suddenly, there was no therapy at all. I was I was forbidden to see her very suddenly. Um, substance abuse, uh, immigration, migration, her legal standing, juvenile courts. Is she an adjudicated delinquent? Or in the United States, we have something called child in need of services. Why is she a delinquent to get these services? Um, the pregnancy, her bisexuality, and how she's dealing with that, um, especially when she's punished for... Um, for, for liking girls. Um, the statutory rape and sex for drugs, ambiguity of, um, of her, her last time in England, um, adolescent homelessness, um, her bo little boy. And I'll finish the religion and identity and the female delinquency. And I'll finish by saying that I followed up with her caseworker uh, about a year and a half after our therapy ended. And she had been released from the home. Um, she'd been kicked out of the home. She'd come back. She'd, then she'd been released from the home and sent to a foster family very far away from where the home was. And the home kept her baby. And she took two buses each way three times a week to continue to visit her baby until they found a foster home for, um, for both of them. And that was the last I heard. So I hope this is illuminated by, through example at least, um, how psychosocial research can work. Um, it's a vast field, and um, thank you for your attention.